This is ADT 1160U, Digital Communication Technologies. The title of this video clip is Interview with a Networking Expert. To get a better idea about how to use social media for networking, I interviewed networking expert Keenan Weller. Keenan is the founder and CEO of Live Work Play, a charitable organization that helps people living with intellectual disabilities to get integrated to the community. The analysis questions for the following video clip are as follows. Can you describe your network? How did you start networking? What is the value of your network? How much time do you spend in your network? What are some dangers of networking? I wanted to conduct this interview because I, I have the impression from following you over the past 10 years or so that you've built this business out of not only passion, compassion, but also dedication to a real cause. And you're not working just to work. You're working with a goal in mind. So I have some questions for you about how you've, uh, you started using social networking technologies with Live Work Play. And I just wanted to ask you, can you just describe in a nutshell what your network looks like? It's uh, pretty extensive and... Uh increasingly complex which I think is the beauty of it and also the surprise of it because you know almost everybody in this sector probably is dedicated and devoted in some way and I think we really have to push ourselves to be about more than that and that we it's not about getting credit because we're dedicated it's about you know how well are we engaging and involving other people in the work that we're trying to accomplish and I think specifically people that are not in our own sector uh, I think if you look at the nonprofit sector, one of their biggest deficits is uh, preaching to those who are already uh, engaged, which is limiting in a variety of ways. So I think my first lesson was, even in interpersonal networking, to learn uh, not to stay in a box and to go and explore the rest of the community, and particularly those that are not even involved in the nonprofit community, because in a lot of respects, those are the people that are going to solve the problems of alienation, marginalization, isolation of other people, we can't fix it within a little group of organizations that have that as their mission. And so you just take that same principle and along comes, you know, social media, which, so we started back in the mid-90s and it was really, initially our online strategy was, like most people, focused around website mailing lists. Along comes things like Facebook and you realize this is networks of networks of networks and how powerful that for example, an individual that we are supporting who has a Facebook account is sharing with their own network. I did a really cool thing today because I got help from Live Work Play. And then you have these strangers posting on your Facebook page going, wow, this is really cool. How could I find out more? Or truly extraordinary events that I really never foresaw. So we got a 75% unemployment rate for people with intellectual disabilities. Obviously, very hard for them to get a job. Today, this week, another example, an employer I've never met contacting us to say, I want to hire a person with a disability. Can you help me? Never saw the day this would come just because someone saw something on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter and is coming forward uh, to take part. Like That is an opportunity I just don't think nonprofits should pass up. Indeed. Um, so what, what you have there is you have your clients, which are people with intellectual disabilities, and you have about a, a basis of about 100 clients, from what I understand, or, um, I mean, when I was working with you uh, about seven years ago, it was about 50, 60, and now it's been expanding because of the nature of your, uh, and you have their families, and you have their employers, and you have the staff members, and the friends of the staff, and the volunteers. So it's, it's a pretty extensive network. And one of the things that I had noticed is that you were one of the top profiles on LinkedIn last year. How, how did that happen? Um, I'm really not sure. I'm still trying to understand it because, you know, typically if you're visiting profiles on LinkedIn, it's probably someone you think could give you a job um, or help you in some way. And I've got an agency with 11 people. So it's not a great place to, you know, if you're, uh, if you're in the job market. And... Uh, I don't think I can particularly offer all kinds of uh, leads to, uh, to wealth or whatever people are pursuing, but I think it's because uh, my profile is very uh, extensive and a bit weird because uh, unlike some people, I didn't worry about only showcasing my 
you know, my two or three professional jobs, I went all the way back uh, to when I had a snowblowing business. <laughs> and apparently people really enjoy hearing about uh, these old jobs. And I guess also I, I do actively participate. I found some groups on LinkedIn, uh, which is great because it's a chance to get a global perspective on issues that I care about locally. And I'm pretty vocal. And so sometimes it takes time. People don't always just contact you right away and and, and enter in a discussion, but sometimes it's like years later they'll be saying, well, I first saw you here talking about this issue, and I thought that's exactly what we need to be doing. And uh, so a lot of that sort of what comes around goes around uh, definitely is part of social media. Right. So how, how did you get into social media? What was the impetus? Well, I had a history, so I fell into something in the mid-'90s working on a project called Canada's SchoolNet which was a national website focused on uh, bringing educators together through internet because it was quite new and obviously there was potential. And so I was tasked with uh, working mainly on special education. And really what we were doing then was a website and a number of mailing lists. And the mailing lists really were a form of social media, just an old form. And so that's where I first saw the power of a teacher in the Yukon uh, giving advice to someone in Shawinigan and this sort of thing that they never would have received. And it's a chance when you're looking for answers to questions, obviously the more people you can reach, the better off you'll be instead of just, you know, only meeting exclusively in a little group of eight people in your own school or your own city. So I was very moved by that and also uh, I learned a lot because I got to moderate all of this and I soaked up all this information and uh, so I was kind of sold on that concept and then I guess we really exploded in social media uh, because we had at one time a community access computer lab for uh, you know it was for everybody but mostly our own members were using it and I started noticing more and more they were on this thing called Facebook and I didn't know much about it and I thought it's only for university students that kind of thing and I thought well if they're on it maybe we should be on it and let's see what's happening so it really started, it was a user-driven thing that the staff needs to get educated on what this Facebook thing's all about. Because our members are on there, and there could be risks and opportunities, and we should we should be there with them. So that's how it got going. Okay. Can you imagine your life right now at Live Work Play without social networks? No, definitely not. And uh, I think those that don't see the necessity, they've maybe uh, been misled or haven't gotten the right, maybe they're watching mainstream media and, and they think that, YouTube and Twitter is just about cats that chase their tails and things. Because that is a lot of the popular portrayal of social media. And they probably wouldn't envision something like my first example of an employer contacting me to give someone a job. Um, but also people that are out in the, in the world feeling um, isolated or lost. And they're out exploring Facebook and these places for help. And so... You know, I'm part of, it's really not directly connected to Live, Work, Play, but I'm part of an online group for um, Ontario Disability Support Program recipients who are constantly reinventing the wheel, trying to figure out how to apply, um, how much money can I keep, all of these things. And I know it's really helped a lot of people who are already struggling with mental health issues. And the last thing you need is taking on complex bureaucracy by yourself. And so those sort of user support networks are incredibly valuable and I kind of see that part of making ourselves available as a resource. Also, obviously, it comes back to you. So, you know, I just got a call from someone today in London, Ontario, and I was like, how did you hear about us? And so it's, you know, someone that was at a conference, um, and I don't even know this person, was saying, oh, Liver Play is great. If you're in Ottawa, you have to call them. And I just think that is so uh, valuable and there's nothing like those sort of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, references to establish... Right. What you're about? People, uh, people often say, "Well, yeah, there's there's issues with with social networks, but there's also the fact that uh, it, it takes a lot of time." So, how much time do you spend in your network? Like, what exactly do you do you do in that activity? Yeah, so I've I've taken part in uh, workshops where you kind of go and learn how to do social media, and uh, either I'm doing it all wrong <laughs> because never in those workshops is anything they're describing what I do. They will have set out a schedule and you should send out three tweets by this amount of time and then go on Facebook and set up a bunch of timed posts and like have a little matrix and an Excel sheet and then track your results. And for me, it's just as organic as networking with human beings in a room. 
Like, I guess you could do a bit of planning on that. You could say, I really want to meet this person, this person, and this person. But in a room of 800 people at a banquet or something, you kind of have to go with the flow, and there would be opportunities, or someone comes over to you and say, did you know so-and-so's here? You should really connect. And so that's kind of how my day starts. It's I'm probably thinking about things before I go to bed that I want to do the next day, people I want to talk to, or questions I want answered, or places I want to contribute. And sometimes I follow through on that, and sometimes... I open my email, look at my Twitter account, go on Facebook, and I realize something new and exciting is happening, and that becomes a big part of my day, and maybe those other things less so. So for me, it's kind of more organic. It's throughout the day. Um, I just see it as part of my job, and I don't really, I don't see it as my social networking time versus my uh, leadership time. It's all one thing. So you get an idea at one point, oh, as soon as I open my... Facebook account, I'll post it, or I'll, as I have two minutes to do this, I tweet this. It's become a habit for you, I suppose, right? Definitely, and I guess there's some days where maybe I wish I had a bit more of a plan, but mostly I'm happy with the fact that uh, it's just in my head to cycle through my networks uh, and combine that with news coming out of the staff team, news coming from the world, and just process it all and look for opportunities to contribute or in some cases to showcase um, our own work. That's good stuff. So when, uh, as you do that, however, I mean, it's, there's a lot of good stuff, but there's also the pitfalls and the dangers and sometimes things appearing that you might think, oh my, uh, what's happened there? So can you talk a little bit about, about the dangers of that working? How do you handle that? Well, yeah, I mean, there's some of the obvious when someone can post something nasty. Uh, and it can be really cruel and maybe targeted to the people we support. So this is a common thing I've heard in workshops and things. People are really worried. What if someone says something bad on our Facebook page? And I guess my reaction to that has always been they're probably saying something bad about you anyway. And so this is an opportunity to be aware of it and also to deal with it. And some of the best, um, I'll say, most interesting discussions or outcomes has been people saying very negative things, and I'm pretty much, unless they're just being really rude and hateful and there's no sign that they're going to stop, in which case you just do like you would in real life, I, you know, this is not a productive conversation, it's over. Um, but mostly I've had lots of success with just sticking with people and identifying like what's their real concern, and we've had lots of good results of people going, I had completely different information, I really apologize, I was upset. Um, and sometimes those people then become champions because they'll say, well, everywhere else I try to talk about this, they just shut me down. Um, and you're the first people that listen to me. And I'm sorry I was rude. <laughs> I remember um, a while ago, and, and I can cut this from the conversation if ever you decide. I'll just snip it. Um, there was a Facebook page uh, about an issue regarding your vacation. Um, so... Yeah, I remember that you, you, you created the page due to some comments and uh, you, you took this opportunity to inform people of what your job was actually all about. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, the reaction, the reason why you did that and how you handle it and uh, sort of how it reflected on you at that point? Yeah, that's had some really, actually some really important um long-term changes as well. But in the, in the short term, basically, yeah, what happened was uh, I was going on vacation, and people in my own world, uh, even the 100 or so people and their extended networks, they know it's been, at the time it had been, what, 12 or 13 years, we really hadn't had much of a vacation. So there was no issue. All those people were very supportive. By all means, you know, go to an island and, and be on the beach. Um, but, you know, sometimes, especially in the charitable sector, there's people out there that are just, uh, basically have some attitudes that if you're helping people in need, then you shouldn't be enjoying life, sort of a kind of perspective. So one of those people apparently came forward, and I heard from a, a friend of a friend that these things are being said. Uh, and so I thought about that, and I decided, well, one response, I can just privatize Facebook, that's it. I won't share my personal life. And I know a lot of people have, have taken that approach. I just said, it's not going to work. Like, I can't be a social networker, and then say, but not for me. The rest of you, please talk about live, work, play, and share your lives. But for me, there's going to be a wall, and 
all you'll see is like where I work and that's it. So decided let's just take it head on. And so how that's emerged now is as an organization, we take great care to explain that we treat our staff well um, and that requiring them to take quality, you know, vacation time, uh, not work excessively, uh, all that is a part of our culture and why we have uh, good staff and why we keep good staff and also that um, you cannot, in human services, you cannot help people effectively if you are not well. And all that is really important and so it was an interesting lesson at first it was like kind of a personal intrusion and it kind of it definitely hurt my feelings but that lasted about 10 minutes and then I realized uh, this is an opportunity because being aware that people might be thinking these things let's just take it head on and turn it right around its head and let's stress publicly on our website and other places that uh, we believe in treating people who work in this sector really well because their work is hard and uh, they deserve to have decent holidays and vacations a very good lesson taught, I think. I always use this lesson anyway in my courses. I really think it's it's uh, you know one of the ways to turn around whatever dangers can happen through social media. But you need to be quite sturdy to do that. So um, on the one hand, I, I do appreciate that you, you provide this environment of safety to your users as well. On the other hand, um, I think your your uh, your lesson actually will serve people very well. So I thank you very much for uh, sharing the wealth of your knowledge uh, with this interview, and we'll certainly add the link liveworkplay.ca on that uh, YouTube video. Great, thank you. The synthesis questions for this video clip are as follows: Take the time to go to www.liveworkplay.ca and skim the website to see what kind of digital communication technologies they use to promote the organization. Search for Keenan Weller on the web to see on which social media he has been active. How could Keenan influence how Mary uses digital communication technologies for her language school?